Good afternoon and welcome to our Charter Day event. So glad that you're here today. And uh, this is uh, a second year that the, the, the WCU Foundation has been working with a, a day of giving, which is what one of the things that we want to do with our Charter Day. And I've been following closely with our foundation folks. I think we were a little over $40,000 in gifts already today. And uh, the goal is 150000 So if anybody's listening in or you're here, if you could find, uh, see in your heart a way to give a little bit back to this wonderful institution, we certainly would appreciate that. But we're here right now for an, another, uh, another great event. And I'm, I'm delighted that you could join us today for this Charter Day and the unveiling of a project that was several years in the making. Dr. Kowalkowski, I, I said it right five times before I got up here, right? Put her soul into this project. But I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the contributions of her dean, Dr. Jen Bacon, for her support with release time to help keep this project moving forward and Ron McCall for his contributions as curator of this very special place, special collections. And if you get a moment to look around this room today, there's some wonderful pieces of history here that uh, are um, evident for you to see. Additionally, uh, I know Ann has spent countless hours coordinating with Dr. Michael Genovene to produce the 150th Anniversary Museum, which is located on the main floor of the Francis Harvey Green Library. And lastly, I wanted to make sure that we could thank Jenna Birch and the Alumni Association for their support to add a series of video tours that complement Ann's book and our museum uh, exhibition this year. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ann Kowalkowski. She earned her PhD in American History from the University of Delaware with a focus in material culture and historic preservation. She also has a master's in American history and British and American literature from Villanova University. But most importantly, she joined WCU in the fall of 2013 and is now an associate professor in our history department. Please welcome the author of our 150th anniversary book, We Serve, Dr. Ann Kolakowski. Well, as John said, this was a project that went on for several years, and if you look at the two pages of acknowledgments, you'll see how many people were actually involved in this project. Um, and many, many people in many departments and the administration, and of course many in the library. So I'm delighted that we're holding this event today in Special Collections, where to a great extent the Westchester history was birthed. Um, and I spent many, many cold hours here <laughs> in the library. Thank goodness for crowds um, and body heat. Um, so since I've been working on the project and in the months we've been waiting for it to actually manifest itself in physical form, and many people, well, maybe not many, but quite a few people have asked me what was the most interesting thing that I found out about Westchester University and its history. And I can honestly say that everything I found out was pretty interesting. And some of my family members and friends and colleagues who were here know that for three years I was like, you'll never guess what happened in 1892. You'll never guess what so-and-so said in 1923. And, um, so they know that I was being honest when I said that everything was pretty interesting. But I think the most interesting thing, and I've saved this for the big reveal today, um, is not a fact that I found out about the school, it's a realization that dawned on me over time, from reading the Normal School Act, to looking at the issues that came up on campus, to seeing who the students were. And that important thing is this, today we hear a lot about Westchester providing an accessible education to our students, some of whom are here right now. I'm very happy about that. Um, and that is absolutely true. And a lot of that is to do with the first trustees, their policies, faculty and administrators along the way. But that accessibility, it, it, it originated here, that concept on the campus. It didn't come from the state. The state never really intended to provide an accessible education. 
to Pennsylvania students, and certainly not to students from other states. That comes from the campus, and in large measure from the students themselves and their struggles to obtain an education. So I thought for the little talk that I was asked to give today, I'm going to focus on the students. I'm going to focus on how they carved opportunities for themselves beyond what the state actually intended for much of the school's history, and how in carving out those legacies, they, those opportunities, they actually have left us a lot of legacies that students and faculty still benefit from today. So first, I need to talk very briefly about the Normal School Act and what the state created the schools to do. So the Normal Schools uh, the Normal School Act was written and passed in 1857, and it came after there were growing numbers of Pennsylvanians attending elementary school. So all of a sudden, the education of teachers became a broader social concern and, and a worry. A lot of teachers were only great graduates themselves and not even. Um, so for several years, there was a lot of debate, a lot of political wheeling and dealing, and eventually 12 districts were carved out of the state. Um, eventually a little bit more wheeling and dealing created a district for Clarion. And then in the 19-teens, the state institutionalized racism in this system by um, creating Cheney, which the new NAACP fought legally for many years, um, the creation of that school. Um, so Westchester is the sixth of the normal schools that was founded in Pennsylvania. And like those before and after, it was a private school. It was a private school for its first 50 years. So the schools were nominally state schools because they prepared students to pass a state test and get state credentials. Um, but the state of Pennsylvania, this might not come as a surprise to some of you, didn't want to be committed to providing funding for education and the um, <laughs> training of teachers. Um, and so they alleviated that possibility by allowing stockholders to form schools um, and trustees. And some schools, like Millersville, were owned solely by the trustees. If you had 13 people, that's all you needed. They could own it. So until 1913, when the state began buying the schools back, Westchester, like the other normal schools, was a private school, completely owned and operated by stockholders. Um, and this, but the state mandated that only those students could attend who planned on teaching for the state. So they looked at it as occupational training for civil servants who were needed by the state, nothing more. And the teaching of teachers, the preparation of teachers is very important. It's always been a hugely important mission for this school, and Westchester was so good at it that by the 1890s it was nationally known as a model institution for the training of teachers. But there was something else going on on this campus, and we know that from many sources. This, I'm not the first person to write a history of the school. Many of you know the 100th anniversary. The first kind of history or compilation of information was the 25th anniversary history. And don't you love this cover with the sunshine? The sun never sets um, on the Westchester <coughs> campus. It's a great image. But Andrew Thomas Smith, the principal who compiled this information, notes that during the first 25 years, 13,000 students had enrolled in classes. 700 had graduated. So that's a big discrepancy, right? And it's not, I don't want everybody getting upset, it's not that 12,300 failed and weren't able to pass because Westchester did a bad job. They came here for a different reason. We can also see the Alumni Association is one of the legacies of students. The first group of graduates one year later came back to establish the Alumni Association. So student, students started that organization, which you know is going strong. The Alumni Association was named the Alumni Association of Graduates and Non-Graduates. So clearly it was understood by the students and faculty of that time that many who would attend classes were not graduating and it was all right. They were part of the community and part of the family. So what was happening was the state just wanted to train elementary school teachers because they needed elementary school teachers. The fact was many other Pennsylvanians wanted an education so they came here anyway and the trustees welcomed them. The trustees, even in their first catalog, advertised not only were they going to train teachers, 
they were going to offer a liberal arts education. So they flouted the normal school law when they openly advertised that they would take t students for this purpose. They had run a classical academy before this, the Westchester Academy, um, which was notable. It had a, a pretty widespread reputation. Uh, for educating students, and although they folded that academy and used the money to create the normal school, the seed money, they were men who seemed sincerely interested in education and respected education, and so they also wanted to carry that over into the normal school, and you can see how many students came for that reason. Um, so that's pretty extraordinary, and that's what I think is really interesting that here on the campus, despite state limitations, this campus was always offering more and struggling to give the kids more useful, timely advice than the state was providing for for a long time, which is not what I expected to find out when I started the project. So here's a view of some of the early students. You can see most young women came to the campus to train as elementary school teachers. They, not the male students, were the ones who were going to go into the poorly paid occupation of elementary school teaching, okay? And you'll see that some of them were older. Students then, as now, struggled to pay for an education. Many of them taught for quite a few years before they were able to take classes. And they took classes for a semester, taught for a few years, came back, taught for a few years. There was no such thing as graduating in four years or five years. There was nothing set. People, students needed to do what they needed to do to get the education and to pay for it. On the other hand, most young men came to school for other reasons, not to be elementary school teachers, because young men don't seem to have um, sought eagerly the low-paid occupation of elementary school teaching. Um, so they came at a much earlier age. As you see here, some of these boys were 14 and 15 years old. They came directly from eighth grade. Um, so they came as a high school. So that was a critical gap that the normal school filled in, elementary schools were proliferating, but the high schools were few and far between. In fact, in 1910, fewer than 15% of Pennsylvanians attended high school, which is why they were referred to as people's colleges. So we're talking about a strand of higher education that we should be proud of. It is the most democratic chapter in the narrative of higher education. Um, and we see, so the young men were younger, female students were a little older. They were here for the normal school program. And the only reason to graduate was because you wanted the state credential. So it's not a failure on the part of the 12,000 who didn't graduate. They came to get a high school education, to go into business, to go to college, um, which they did successfully. How did students feel about this? Well, I can find out because I am always scrolling on eBay looking for school memorabilia. And I would like to point out the benefits of people recording things on paper, which end, <laughs> end up on eBay. So here's a postcard from a young woman named Bessie. And we can see that she was really happy. I don't know how long she was here. I haven't identified her. But she writes, here at present, love it so far. So she clearly, in just a phrase, we know that this is one young student who really valued her time at the university. Another student who I'm sure felt equally the emotions of Bessie was a student named Ann Goshen, a name I'm sure a lot of you have heard before. We tend to think of her as a longtime professor, but she began as a struggling student here on campus. So whether students intended to become teachers or pursue other career paths, they did struggle to attend. The normal school, um, the second semester began after the elementary school year ended mid-spring, so that teachers, after they taught their school year, could enroll in the second semester of the normal school program, which is what Annie Goshen did for three years. Anne Goshen was luckier than many students. She lived four miles from a high school. She lived in Lafayette Hill. She walked four miles to the high school in Conshohocken. At the end of the day, she walked home. She ended up teaching for a few years. For three years, she enrolled part-time at the normal school. But it was her heart's desire to be a full-time student for one year at Westchester, something she finally achieves. And she graduated in the class of 1888. Um, with a normal certificate. She went on to the University of Michigan. She did graduate work at Stanford and Penn. 
and eventually came back to a long-time career. And if anybody thinks of her when they walk past the building, if anybody even knows who she is, I'm sure they think of her as a professor. But since working on this project, when I walk past now, I think of her walking four miles to school in Conchahokan and longing to get to the normal school. Um, before the yearbooks began in 1910, the daily local news was a good source of information. And so in 1894, the artist provided some caricatures of the graduate class. And one interesting thing about this, in the lower left-hand side, you see two sisters. So it's always been a tradition that siblings have come and family members over se several generations. So we see this in this, this image here. Um, but the Daily Local was very interested in students. The school was important in the town and often did interviews with students. So in 1890, um, there was an interview with a young student named Jen Charsky. So Jen was a Russian Jewish girl who had come here with her family in the 1880s. And according to Jen, her father did not believe in education for sons or for daughters. And so he sent Jen out to work in a sweatshop in Philadelphia. She worked for several years in the sweatshop, but her male boss took an interest in her because she thought Jen was very, he thought Jen was very bright, and he encouraged her to attend night school in Philadelphia. One of her night school teachers was a Westchester alum, and that young woman took an interest in Jen, brought her out here because she was reluctant to come because she didn't speak English very well, and that alone talked the trustees into taking a chance on admitting her. Her sister, Fanny, also followed her. I don't know, I don't think they graduated, I don't think they were interested in teaching, but certainly their time here on campus helped them improve their English so they could make their way in their new home. So these were the kinds of students who made their way to the Westchester campus during this time. And if the school had been restricted, if the trustees had not taken these only students who wanted to be elementary school teachers, Janice and Fanny are two of the students who wouldn't have been able to um, use it as a start on their life path. Um, students have left many legacies and we can see some of their ambitions and hopes um, even in some of the images that don't actually include students. The library, another reason I'm very pleased to be giving this talk here, was begun by students, not by the faculty or the trustees. The State Normal School Act mandated that trustees set aside a room for a library but again, we're talking about Pennsylvania. There was another state law that forbid state monies or tuition from being used for library books. Um, so um, the students in the um, literary societies, which were very popular clubs, began, despite their struggles, began buying books so they could lend back and forth to each other. And eventually they combined their books and created the school library. And you see the first picture here on the left. And then in the 25th anniversary book, it had expanded to three rooms. But this is all by dint of the students. And by that time, trustees were also contributing books and funds. And now it's Francis Harvey Green Library. What did the library mean to students? Here's another of my eBay finds that I'm going to share with you. A picture of the new library that was built um, in the early 20th century. And notice that this student, Grace, has underscored the word library, library, state, normal school, Westchester. And at the end, she says, this is something that I know you would appreciate too. It is so pretty and so very useful. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what this building and this collection of books meant to the students. So students also have um, created a legacy through their numerous publications. Now we call the school paper the Quad. It's gone through a number of iterations. Um, and we can see some of their stories um, about their experience in campus. These are great sources. They were heavy sources that I used for the book. But we also learn what students did with their educations because the alumni wrote extensive letters back to the school. So one, Carrie Bemis, who graduated with Annie Goshen in 1888, saw an opportunity in 1889 when the territory of North Dakota was made a state and she went out to North Dakota to help set up a normal school with her normal school degree and wrote back about living with farm families and the adventure of being a new graduate but being the, the director of a normal school all of a sudden out in Western territory. By the turn of 1900, students were writing back from teaching positions and other careers from places like Cuba, 
Puerto Rico, France, and as far away as Constantinople. So that's what they did with their Westchester educations at that time. Other students, such as Filipino Justo Ramos and Native American Florence Sickles, acquainted the other students with their home cultures by writing articles um, in the school publications, which we can read about, and give us a glimpse at the diversity of the early student body from the very beginning. Some of the students wanted to leave more permanent memories of themselves on campus, so in the 1890s with the first big building campaign, students started taking the lead in creating time capsules and orchestrating the cornerstone ceremonies. This is, to keep the theme going, the old library's cornerstone, which is kind of hidden by um, the bushes. Um, but we know that the class secretary, Dawny George, the young woman who laid the time capsule in the box that was put inside the cornerstone, was one of 35 young Native American women who came from Indian schools and reservations because they wanted to, to earn credentials to teach in public schools. Um, so there's that part of the school's history, too. The yearbooks were also started by the students and are another legacy that show what the education meant to them. And I think the yearbooks were inspired by this, which we have several copies here, um, a mosaic of normal school memories. My copy, of course, I got on eBay, um, like a lot of things I own now, um, <laughs> Westchester memorabilia. There's a lot of great stuff on there from, from Westchester. Um, but Reed Kirkland, who graduated in the class of 1901, did want to teach for a few years, but he always wanted to be a photographer. He did go on to become a very well-known photographer in South Carolina. His photographs are easy to find on Google and eBay. And, um, so he came back to a reunion and he took about 50 photographs of the campus and compiled this little album. And a number of the images in the 150th anniversary come from this book. But just a few years later, another student, another familiar name, John Hollinger, class of 1910, and a group of students created the first yearbook. Um, and so this is a great exhibit of student talents and their humor. Their humor is great over the years um, in the yearbook. Um, so the yearbooks are a great um, source. They also make visible some things that are harder to flesh out um, before there are lots of images because images of individual students are few and far between before the yearbooks. It's usually views that are far away of very large groups of students. So the yearbooks make visible the black students who are on campus at this time, um, which are harder to trace. There's evidence that there were some young black students on campus by the end of the 19th century, but this young man, Walter Smith, is the first documented black graduate in the same class as John Hollinger, 1910. And unlike many young men, he did take the elementary school course, and I've tracked his history. He did end up getting a teaching job in Wilmington, Delaware. It was difficult. Even though students could come to the school, it was difficult for them to find jobs, particularly in Chester County. Um, and so they often had to go south or go to New Jersey and other states to find jobs. But uh, Walter Smith got a job, and I know at least 15 years later he was still teaching in Wilmington, Delaware. Um, and you can see in his senior bio, he belonged to the Moore Society. So he was one of the students who participated in the literary societies. That was difficult because, of course, black students weren't allowed to live on campus in that era. And the clubs met a lot in the evening and weekend. So it was very difficult, more difficult for them to participate. So they also have to carve out opportunities for themselves. That might come a little easier to some of the white students. Um, but we see many of them through the yearbooks, many of them participated in the literary societies and sports teams beginning in the early 20th century um, was very popular um, with the young men. Um, another student, James Richards, who was a member of the Moore, a year later wrote back a very lengthy letter to the school newspaper to talk about what his experience at Westchester meant to him. And one sentence he wrote was, while in the normal school as a colored student, I found that my social and material progress in the school was fostered by my affiliation with the society. I became a champion debater. And the, the two literary societies were a lot about debate and encouraging civic engagement. So that's what the Moore Society um, and his activities meant to him. Andrew Thomas Smith told the NAACP in the early 20s that about 35 black students were on campus each year. And from that time, their numbers slowly but steadily increased on the campus. 
Um, but again, because they don't live on campus, it's harder for them to participate. Um, so it's a little harder for them to carve out opportunities. However, the faculty, even in the Jim Crow era, and again, Francis Harvey Green, I'm glad we're in the library named after him, at a faculty meeting in 1915, he made a motion that the graduation, order of graduation, seating in the chapel, seating in the auditorium should not be segregated, but it should be integrated. And the faculty, I'm happy to tell you, unanimously approved that. But not all white students were comfortable with that decision. Um, we know from uh, some of the faculty um, records. So memories of black students vary. Dorothy Fletcher, whom you see here on the left dot, um, belonged to the Day Students Club and did remember later that some, not all white students, but some did make her a little, feel a little bit unwelcome. On the other hand, just a few years later, Geneva Henderson, who was a star music student, um, and the first black student to sing the solos at the Christmas concert to great acclaim, recalled that she had many white friends on campus and they would often smuggle her into their dorm room so she could change for conference. So she, concerts. So she clearly had, um, you know, a, a friendship circle on campus among white students. Sports and music, students took the lead. Um, creating many teams. It was students who had been arguing since the 19th century that they should be able to have a football game, a football team, something that many of the faculty did not approve of, contact sports. But eventually the students pressed and pressed and pressed, particularly the Eichingers, the Erringers. I'm, I've never been sure how to pronounce that name. Does anybody know for sure an official pronunciation? The Jim Eichinger, Erringer? I think it's Anger. Anger, okay, thanks. Um, he really was against contact sports, but they got a football team and they got other sports clubs as well. And then young men started the jazz club, which today we know is the Criterions, or slowly evolved into the Criterions, but guess what? No girls, no girls in the marching band until the 1970s, right? <laughs> um, so the young girls took up the challenge because in the school newspaper, the male students wrote that girls couldn't play jazz. They might be able to do classical, but they couldn't produce jazz. Um, so they took them up, um, and this is one of the several girls jazz bands, and you can see they have their, their smart uniforms on, which they were so proud of and, and had fun with. So by the 1940s in World War II, this is what the campus represented to students. You can see 12 and a half acres of opportunity. Um, and that comes from the students themselves. By 1945, the school was a state teacher's college, and that's often thought of or assumed to be a step forward. But what I found out was the school leaders and administrators and many of the faculty in the 1920s when this was debated, that opposed that. They were ready in the 1920s to be a liberal arts school. You've seen the numbers. They knew that many students wanted an education to come to school. They bitterly opposed the state restricting, continuing the restriction to just teachers, as proud as they were of that part of their mission and their reputation for teaching. But again, the state wasn't about to pay for a liberal arts education. Um, and so created, and in fact, enforced the schools to keep offering normal school certificates until 1938, even though they couldn't get jobs anymore with normal school certificates. But the school, Cameron and subsequent administrations, did everything they could to keep students from going in that path. They stopped including it in the catalog. They don't depict people in the yearbooks because they know they're not going to get jobs. So they're trying to give them better advice. Cities led the way, not the state in Pennsylvania. Um, so it's 12 and a half acres of opportunity for the students, but that's, again, it's coming from the campus. It's not coming from the state. The state also, when it decides to stick to elementary, and by that time junior high, and eventually in the 50s high school will be added, but since it's, that requires postgraduate classes, it's economically burdensome for students, as it is today. Um, they force students to sign the obligation of the state, promising that they would teach for so many years in the state. Now, a lot of students sign it having no intention of teaching, and people know it, but they don't care because they want to give these kids an education, and it's their only option. Veterans also emphasize this, were inundated with hundreds and hundreds of young men 
Um, but again, young men, even at that time, don't want to become elementary school teachers. Um, it was lower paying, um, and so many of them leave, including the father-in-law of President Fiorentino. He came as a veteran during this period, but he wanted to study languages, so he left. He eventually comes back and starts a language department. Um, but veterans and veterans groups start advocating there has to be a broadening of the mission. The people on the campuses are right. The state is wrong. And so in 1960, Westchester with the other schools become a state college, and they are worried that there's going to be, not worried, but they anticipate an enrollment tidal wave, which certainly happens. The broad array of majors and programs begins attracting a larger and even more diverse student body, and we see this in the initiative taken by students um, in the state college era, an NAACP club, and then the Black Student Union, which you see here on the left. Spanish students, Hispanic students have never been terribly large in number on campus, but they were a presence, and they were proud of their presence. So in 1976, they form a Hispanic club to make other people aware and to hold festivities and fairs to acquaint people with their culture and what they can bring to the campus. And then in the 1970s, we also see the gays of Westchester forming a club. We know from a student biography that there was what he called a gay circle here on campus in the 1930s, centered on the theater program. The young man is Donald Vining. He's written a multi-volume autobiography. Um, but by the late 1970s, these students were ready for more visibility and to make their presence felt. And then students who were physically challenged often needed more accommodation for physical access, which is another part of accessibility, right? And they had to sometimes remind the administration to get out and plow the sidewalks uh, more effectively and so on and curb cuts. Um, so that was another development where students took part of the initiative for that. So in the 60s and 70s and 80s, there was a lot going on politically. Um, as you already know, and students played an important role in that. There was an independent statewide association that lobbied for student interest, and Westchester students were the majority of members and were almost all of the leaders um, during its um, existence. They also very successfully stopped a tuition increase in the early 1980s that the governor had imposed halfway through the school year unexpectedly on the students, unfortunately, in retaliation, that Governor Dick Thornburg, um, with the help of the faculty union, squashed um, the Commonwealth Association of Students, so they lost their independent voice at that time. For a long time, there was hard feeling on the part of the students towards the faculty because of that, but that obviously has died down many years ago, and in 2016, when the faculty went on strike, the students came out and supported them. Uh, and as you know, students have continued to shape the physical campus and leave legacies and add to the activities that we all enjoy today. My favorite has to be the Gordon Natural Area um, down on South Campus, an area that was preserved um, at the initiative of, of some of the students um, and the Ram statue. So for a number of years, several decades actually, Westchester had the motto of we serve. Um, opening the campus to accessible education to many students, whatever their career goals. But I think it's also important to remember that generations of students have served later generations and also served the school, leaving lasting legacies. So thank you very much. So any, any questions or comments? I think I've totally lost track of time. So. Questions or comments from anybody? Neil? How much does your book cost, do you know? I have no idea. <laughs> today you Maybe John can tell today, you. Today you get a free copy of yeah. here. Right. Uh, but we will have it on sale in the bookstore for $15, and the, any proceeds from the book are going to be mm -hmm. used to uh, help fund the scholarships for students. Because mm -hmm. it's all about okay. these, sir. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. available for uh, photographs for your book? Yes, of course. I've been practicing. <laughs> <laughs> and if you saw my writing, you'd know I need practice. <laughs> Good.
Well, thank, thank, thank you. you all. Other questions? Oh, I was just going to ask, uh, somewhere I read that the Normal School program was a two-year program, but mm -hmm. it sounds like it's a little more complicated than that. Yeah, well, it was two years, and in fact, to show you how weak the educational system was in Pennsylvania, the first group of students came, it starts in September 1871, the first graduation is 1874, three years later, all the first students needed the probationary program, because they came, you know, not that they were bad students, there was just no education for them. So it eventually becomes three years, and then it eventually becomes, in the 1920s, it becomes a four-year program. Yeah. So it's, it's constantly changing and expanding. Mm -hmm. Neil? How long, did it how long did it take you working on the book to have it the whole time you worked on How long did you work on it? I think, well, if you count the last year, which really, after the summer, I didn't work on We had it pretty much proofread. We've been waiting for the printer. So I think three, maybe three and a half years. I, I, to tell you the truth, I don't remember when I started. I still remember the moment Bob Kadosky came into my office. We were the chair of the history department. We were in um, Anderson, which we loved walking. Don't you love walking in and out of this building? It's like it makes us feel like college professors. <laughs> which Gothic has never been predominant on normal school campuses, which is uh, you know more democratic tradition. But I still remember him like sitting down in his calm manner saying, so do you want to work on something to do with the history of the university? And I'm like, yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> and I was like, I had no idea what it was going to be. Yeah. Tanya. Um, so this, thank you for this talk, and thank you for this um, this book. Um, my back is straighter to working at Westchester, particularly seeing just the role that students have played, mm -hmm. right? And I love the fact that you use, you know, how they are very, you know, democratized in the education here. So thank you. This book also seems to have various, um, you know, various other topics that emerge. So other subjects that you can write about, right? Mm -hmm. So what's next? What is your next project? Are, is, are any um, a, um, future projects related to your research of this book and what are they if so mm -hmm. actually um, I'm just finishing up a little article on the the campus as material culture and some of my students have been through walking tours as I explain how it's a, a physical artifact and historical evidence so I'm really pleased to see them so old Maine and new Maine Victorian modern to mid-century modern and what it tells us about those values you know well they know which one I don't like um, <laughs> so um, that's fun. And then I am talking about some of the political issues, um, how the school, you know, Chester County was instrumental in the formation of the National Republican Party, so it remains very strong in uh, state politics. And state politics, whether it's Democrat or Republican, it's always been um, an issue tied to the school, so I am writing an article about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why is there so much uh, Westchester memorabilia on eBay? <laughs> it's worth There's a lot of money. <laughs> There's Harvard memorabilia on eBay. It's great. There are yearbooks. And I have my own collection of yearbooks. The, you know, historical societies often sell off, um, you know, duplicates and stuff like that. So I found a lot of great stuff. Um, there's some stuff on there now I would like. Actually, I, there's in special collections, it's not out. There's a really nice lampshade, probably from the 40s. Of the, it's like kind of a beautiful green and red map of it. I think we should reproduce that. I would love to have that lampshade. <laughs> I so, have some cheaper here at special collections. Yeah, I have some merchandising ideas. The 1935 yearbook won an award for student drawings. Ability. I think they should be made into like cards. And students still write letters and little notes to professors and stuff like that. They would buy them, I think. They're beautiful. Um, yeah. So I have some merchandising ideas. For the <laughs> yeah. I have some things I could sell you. <laughs> um, thank you for your presentation. I had no idea there were time capsules in this cornerstone. Oh, Is yeah. there any record of like what's in the time Oh, every single one. OK. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a list okay. if you want it. I know what's in every single one. Yeah. Up through. Um, Hollinger, 1954. Mm -hmm. As Dr. Tim Taylor put it, um, you chose to, like, you could have written, like, anything particularly of the university. What made you choose, like, the students and what impact did it have on them? Um, well, in the book, there's 
more than the students. It's kind of, you know, I'm from my era, so it's a multi-strand, the state, the faculty, the administration, the students, okay. like all happening at the same time, sometimes not even, even impacted by each other. But I thought for the Charter Day talk and as a talk to highlight something special about the campus. And I've been reading a lot of good papers lately and I'm just feeling very <laughs> positive wow. about the students that just like, came to me. <laughs> so that was why. <laughs> but, you know, as I did the research, I saw how many organizations, publications, they were started by the students. And the most amazing to me was the library. So, you know, I'm very conscious of that now. Well, the one piece I know about the panel is that I will never go past Goshen Hall and not mm -hmm. think of Annie. I mean, you, it's Anne that I'll refer to. She was Annie. called an Annie, actually. Okay, Annie, yeah. I will never look at that building the same, or pass by it and have the same experience. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, if you want, when you go by the Bull Center, they were the two redheaded faculty. They belonged to the Tish and Tints Club. Elsie <laughs> Bull was a demon basketball player. You usually <laughs> see pictures of her when she's pretty elderly, but she could knock over the male students playing basketball, so I can think about that. We had some pretty sassy people. <laughs> and then, since you spoke about time capsules, is there a plan to have a time capsule for the 150th celebration well, of Westchester, or is it more, like, or are there other years that Westchester focuses on? Well, there is a time capsule in the 150th exhibit that everybody is welcome to put something in. I think eventually so many objects are going to be picked mm -hmm. to be preserved. But I would imagine perhaps special collections would keep everything in there because in speaking as a historian, and we have several in this office, in 50 years that would be really interesting to somebody to see what they did. It would be interesting to a lot of people. You know, you've got to save stuff. Yes. That's what this room is all about, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, you have to have a place to stick stuff until <laughs> time goes by and people are interested in it, you know? And obviously we do think people are interested because that's why people send stuff here, different offices, different people. We think what we do today is going to be interesting to people in the future. That's why people send it here. And we need to get more here because there are huge gaps. Thank you all for coming out today, and thank you for your presentation. We have a table around the corner, and Anne's happy to put her John Henry on those. Or John on those. And we'll, uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you, folks. Thanks, Jeff.